today I want to talk about high quality language and how it creates high quality learning environments. And I want to start with um, something you probably heard in the news, uh, but it's always shocking to me that more than 80% of third graders from low income families will not be reading in third grade at third grade. And at least half of the school achievement gap between rich and poor kids starts well before kindergarten. That's actually a really important point that I'm going to keep hitting today. That we seem to think that, you know, life starts when you enter the kindergarten door, but I'm going to argue it really does not. But equipped with these facts, something really amazing happened. 42 states across the United States have started campaigns to reverse this trend. And here's their solution. One, more assessment. We need to find every reading deficiency that is out there. Number two, more reading intervention by teaching letter to sound correspondence and drilling vocabulary lists in pre-K and in K. Adding more preschools. And that's a great thing. Now we have preschool for all or whatever the name of it is in your particular area. And this one I particularly like, so we need to just spend a moment on that. What we can do is all we need to do is retain the students who do not read proficiently by the end of third grade. Now, depending on your state, this can be flexible. But here you sit in California where you have perchance a large population that's bilingual and where you might have a whole lot of kids in third grade for a really long time. I have this image of all these third grade schools <laughs> cropping up for the rest of our life. All right, now Hollis Scarborough shows us that there are many strands that are woven into skilled reading. Part of it is language comprehension and part of it is going to be word recognition. Now, word recognition is indeed critical for learning to read. And there are a lot of interventions that are working on how we can get better decoding skills out there. A systematic review of 31 well-cited interventions revealed that children generally learn less than 25% of the words that we are teaching in these interventions. Now, 25%, which is, by the way, the upper part of the range, it's not bad, but it's certainly not stunning. Another meta-analysis examined curriculum interventions and produced a small and non-significant effect size of 0.07 on children's vocabulary. You should all be going, I am not impressed. And those programs that have targeted specific vocabulary lists generally find that the kids can learn the words, but it doesn't generalize to anything. So they cannot use the word in a new context. I don't know how you feel about this, but this gave me pause. It was kind of like the way I learned the SAT words. I sat down, I memorized the words, I really worked at understanding what syzygy and ubiquitous meant. And then I moved on. And if you asked me 10 minutes later after I took the test, I had no idea what it meant. Now, let's go back to Hollis. Hollis says there's another big part here that often gets ignored when we talk about things like reading. And that is the language comprehension piece. And notice here what that includes in her model. Background knowledge, vocabulary, language structures, verbal reasoning, and literary knowledge. A whole lot of stuff that's really, really important if you want to learn how to read, but which is often ignored in the way that we're teaching reading in our schools. And the scientific data show us that there's both direct and indirect evidence linking language to later language and reading skills. Further, a secondary data analysis that I recently did on the NICHD study, child care, uh, the NICHD has a long name, the NICHD study of child care and youth development, Whew. that language at school entry is the single best predictor of school outcomes. The single best 
predictor. And in our models, we looked at how well any of the other predictors could predict out to reading level, to math level, to language level, to social level, and we looked as far out as first and third grade, both to look at whether it predicted your score, your average score in first and third, and also the slope between first and third grade and third to fifth grade. What won out out of all these predictors? It turned out to be language. Now, there's a reason for that. This is my only picture of the brain, but I felt that since I was in a medical school, I had to at least have one picture of a brain. So there it is. <laughs> uh, but anyway, this is actually a picture that was brought to us by Stan DeHaan, who's done a lot of work in this area, and who helps us to understand why language is so darn important to the reading process. And what he shows us is that there's an area that's dedicated to phonemic representation, which is right here. There's a visual cortex here. And what you have to do is you have to link the sound to the visual, all right? And there he says you have what he calls the visual word form area or the brain's letterbox. So if we really want to understand school topics like reading, I guess we have to go back to understanding how we get good language <laughs> scores. Further, there are mountains of behavioral data suggesting that children from under-resourced environments have poorer general language scores, which is probably why it's translating into poorer reading scores. And this is going to turn out to be really important. It was, after all, the theme song of a book that became very important, both in the policy world and in the research world. Now, I have to admit, it really wasn't the best research study that's ever been done in the science. 42 families, and the way they categorized the families was not impressive. But I think their finding generally stands. Here it is. The finding, yes, I hate the terminology for the groups as well. But they called these groups the welfare group, the working class group, and the professional group. And what they tabulated out, and remember now that this has been found in a number of studies since then, is that the amount of language that passed the ear of a child who grew up in an under-resourced home that they called the welfare group was three times actually more than three times less than the number of words that you would hear in the professional group. And that's a problem. If the kids aren't getting enough passing their ears, and if they aren't getting enough quality of language, they're not going to grow their language. And if they don't grow their language, they're not going to grow their reading skills, their math skills, or even their social skills. Now, this has tremendous significance. The significance is that you can see here, if you look at the number of words, it's going to project out to the vocabulary that the young kids have. And that vocabulary that the young kids have, that feeds all the way out to what happens when they're 9 and 10 in standardized tests of vocabulary. It correlates with their reading comprehension on comprehensive tests of basic skills, and by second grade, even predicts how many root words they're going to have, like the teach in teacher, or like the word heal that's sneakily sitting around in the word health. So let's today talk about a shift in the emphasis from merely looking at code and vocabulary to looking at language in all of its glory and to ask how then, if language is so darn important, can we actually up the ante in language learning? Now, I'm going to do something odd here for a scientist, so let me tell you what it is. Most scientists spend their life looking at what's missing. What's the next question? What don't we know? And I'm going to shift the game a little bit today. I'm going to ask, what do we know? 
And what do we know that all of us as scientists could stand behind and that would work just as well if you were talking about kids in typical development or kids in atypical development or kids who are learning one language or kids who are learning multiple languages. And I'm going to boldly suggest that we can come up with six evidence-based principles of language learning that will support reading and so much more. And after I show you those six principles that don't just come from one study, but come from multiple studies, I'm then going to ask, how can we use that to help all kids reach their potential, implications and outreach? So the talk's in two parts. Let's start with the six principles. These are principles that have been distilled from thousands and thousands of papers in the literature that now you don't have to read because <laughs> I'm going to put them on one page, okay? And here are the six principles. Now for most of them as we go through them, and it's okay, you can do this, you're going to go, duh, but I'm going to show you that they're more profound than they might appear at first glance. One, children learn what they hear most. It's okay for you to say it. Duh. If they don't hear it, how are they ever going to learn it? Two, children learn words for things and events that interest them. Three, interactive and responsive environments build language learning. Four, children learn best when the context is meaningful. Five, they need to hear diverse examples of words and of language structures. And six, vocabulary and grammatical development grow together. They cannot and must not be treated separately. All right, children learn what they hear most. Here's the evidence. Amount matters. That's the Hart and Risley data that I already showed you. Amount of speech is important for statistical learning. And amount of speech is important, believe it or not, for speed of processing in some of the most elegant research that I've seen come out of the language literature. <laughs> Statistics. It's 1996. Now a classic paper in the field of developmental psychology is published by Jen Safran and her colleagues. The idea is this, is that in just two minutes of speech, two minutes of speech that is artificial language, she contrives how to put little pieces of words together. And she wants to see if nine-month-old babies can pick up the patterns. Lina di bu ki la vazi li nu ge da bi do a we di ne ba lo zi de li nu. Anybody here li nu more than once? Yeah? All right, how about if I told you that babies can pick out those patterns too? Babies can figure out at the end of this what makes a word and what makes a part word and what makes a non-word. That's unbelievable when you think about it. Amount matters. The second thing is this beautiful research by Weisleder and Fernald. Anne Fernald had been working on a procedure where I have to say she bested me. She took our, <laughs> our intermodal preferential looking paradigm and she did an eye tracking piece of it which she called looking while listening. And it's a very clever way to look at this. This was from the original where we would put something in the center and then we would say, where's the dog? Can you find the dog? Where's the dog? And what we found in our research with our paradigm was that kids would look at the dog more than they would look at the baby. And a lot of little kids would do this and you can make even complex stuff on videos and test this out to begin to unpack what kids knew before they could tell you, all right? And what we also found is that at 18 months, they were faster to look at the target picture then they were, at tw I'm sorry, 24 months, they were faster than at 18 months, all right? And they were more likely to be right at 24 months than they were at 18 months. So here's what she did with it. By putting in this ability to watch frame by frame where the babies were gonna look, she could then test out something incredible. She could look at babies who heard more or less at 18 months of age and she could put them through the same study and ask how quickly do they look at the right place and are they more likely 
to look at the right place. And here's the data. These are all kids who at 18 months heard less blue line or heard more the red line. Let's watch it. You see the slope of the red line is higher and they got to the right answer more quickly. They were more likely to be right and they got there faster. Notice those kids who didn't hear as much, they're down here. They heard less. Oh my gosh. And when Anne talks about this phenomenon, speed of processing, why should I care? I want you to think about what it's like if I slowed down my, are you ready to kill me yet? <laughs> okay, it's horrible. And in fact, you notice this also when you're in a foreign country and you kind of know the language, but you don't really know the language. So somebody said a word that you knew and it was in that sentence, but it was way back there and the person kept speaking on and on, right? And you've lost what they were trying to say. That's the same thing that a child will be in if they have slow speed of processing. Very important for language learning. All right, let's go to children learn words for things and events that interest them. There's really a lot of research in this area. One is Lois Bloom, many years ago, wrote what she called the principle of relevance. If it's relevant, then I'm going to look at it and I'm going to be interested in it and I'm liable to learn it. I know it's another duh, right? But how many times have you seen parents or caregivers trying to lead the baby away from something because they're interested in it, not looking at where the baby's looking. This is gonna be particularly important in conversations I was having last night with, um, with Sally about autistic kids. You gotta look where they're looking. Get into their frame of reference. Babies attach labels to interesting, not boring objects. Evidence from babies and toddlers in joint attention when you're both looking at the same thing. If the mother follows in or the caregiver follows in, the baby's more likely to learn the word. And when we see caregivers who follow in more, it turns out it predicts their vocabulary years later. Um, there's intervention evidence that when you label what the kids are interested in, they learn better. And in the classroom, there is new evidence that reading books that have relevance to the child allows them to learn more words and to have better language skills. Now this is the one I want to spend a little bit more time on because I'm currently totally stoked by this area, which is the social part of language. I was one of those language researchers a long time ago who used to say, ah yes, the social is part of what's going on, but like the real deal is in the cognitive structure of the mind and brain. And there were a whole group of us who thought that cognitive psychology was totally divorced from any kind of social development. In fact, we went to different talks when we went to our professional meetings. And if you had gone to the Boston Language Conference, you would see that they stayed in different rooms for most of the day. We didn't care about them and frankly, they didn't care about us. That's changed. <laughs> I now have to tell you that I believe that early social development is actually core to how kids are gonna to put together cognitive structure. And I think much of what we learn comes from the early interactive and responsive environments that build language learning. Part of it's about talking with, not at or to young children. It's about expanding on what a child says, noticing what they find interesting. In an amazing study, McGillan does this simple intervention. All she says to a caregiver is, look at where your child is looking and comment on it. That's it? And it changes the whole dynamic of the language? The whole outcome structure? Absolutely amazing. Use a label that goes with what you're looking at and ask questions rather than making demands. Let me show you how early this stuff actually starts with this wonderful video that I was able to get of a 10-week-old baby 
And in truth in advertising, this 10-week-old baby is my granddaughter. Oh. 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 That's a magnificent tape. Did you ever know you could have a conversation with a 10 week old? All right, actually, most of the people here probably knew that you could have a conversation with a 10 week old. Believe it or not, most of our parents don't know that. Did you know that? Most caregivers have no idea that you can have a conversation with a 10-week-old baby. And if you look at that conversation closely, there's something very interesting about it. Did you notice at the end, Ellie took a little bit longer to respond? And what didn't happen is Laura didn't jump in. She waited. She allowed for the silence. And then she responded. That's the kind of conversations we're talking about. Now, let's look at some pieces of evidence for these kinds of interactions. First thing is we notice in the Hart and Risley data, actually they noticed, but we can look at it, that parents who were of the professional class, that's the yellow here, tend to give more praising or affirmation kind of language. They use what we'll call conversational openers rather than conversation closers. Things like, wow, yes, even if you're on the telephone. Have you ever talked on the telephone to somebody who has a little kid? Right? It's an amazing experience, right? Because they're constantly talking both to the kid and they're talking to you. I don't know how you do that, but I remember doing it myself, right? And what you see here, look at the blue lines, which is what they called their welfare group, is more likely to have the parents who say, not now, can't you tell I'm on the telephone? Conversation closers rather than conversation openers. The second bit of evidence I want to give you is a study that we did a couple of years ago, again using the NICHD study of early childhood. And we wanted to look at the quality of that interaction and compare it to the quantity of the language that the kids get. We started with 60 low income families. Please note, 60 low income families. We are looking for variability within what Hart and Risley would have called that welfare group. In that welfare group, we found that at age three, we had some kids who had high language scores, and by high, I mean they were absolutely in the normal group, in fact, even at the high end of it at age three, on the Raynell test. We had 20 kids who we chose from the middling language scores, and then we had a group that had struggling language scores. It was a longitudinal study. What we were able to do is to move backwards in time, and then to ask at two years of age, what did the mother-child interaction look like? And could we use that mother-child interaction to predict what the scores were gonna look like at age three, all right? So what did we look for? We looked for the quality of interaction in a coding scheme that Lauren Adamson had done many years before, where she looked at three things. One, symbol-infused joint engagement. My God, what is that? It means dropping words and gestures into the conversation, into the dyadic interaction. Two, was it fluid and connected? In what I showed you with Ellie and Laura, you saw a fluid and connected conversation. There was never really a time when they were disengaged from one another. Three, did they have any routines and rituals? When they picked up a book, did they know what to do with it? And we were also gonna look at the quantity or the number of words the mom used per minute. Well, what happened? Now, I have to tell you that I was particularly proud of this study because we had collected the data so many years before. And I said, wow, we should really look at this and call down to Dallas, Texas, and said to Margaret Owen, would you do me a favor? Would you pick out these kids who did really well, pick out these kids who did really poorly on the Raynell at age three, and don't tell us who they are. And they sent them all to my lab. 
My lab did all the coding, and after all the coding was down, we sent it down to Atlanta, and that's where all the data analysis was done. So we were completely, totally blind, which means you're sitting on the edge of your chair wondering if you're going to die at any moment because you've invested so much time into this study and you don't know if it's going to work. And here is what happens with the results. The findings. How much was accounted for by our quality measures? 16% unique, 16% of the variants. I knew 16% more about what they were going to look like at age three because I knew the quality of their interaction at age two. Well, there's got to be some overlap between quality and quantity because if you don't have quantity, you can't have any quality. So we pick up another 10%. That means that I know 26% by knowing what's going on with the quality and a little bit of the quantity. So you say, well, what happened to unique prediction? by quantity. You ready, guys? Ready for it to be whopping? <laughs> OK, there it is, 1%. All right, what this taught us is that the quantity of input, the amount, and the quality, what we call the foundation for communication, were both important. But the most important thing was going to be the quality of the interaction. In our study, you couldn't say it was about welfare moms and professional moms, because they were all welfare moms by the way they looked at it. And yet there was a range. What this means is that we can do something about it, that you're not locked into anything. Give us a chance to have high quality interactions, and we can change the dynamic on the other side. Turns out fluid and connected conversations, what we came to call conversational duets, because you couldn't sing it alone were going to be the most important thing in our predictions. And I wondered whether we should still be talking about it as filling the gap, or maybe more about building a foundation. And maybe the conversational duet and the conversation and the quality of the interaction is what's really important for language learning. Evidence three, back to the NICHD database, Peg Berkshire and I. I uh, did another study where we just looked at the kind of interactions people had here measured by sensitivity and responsivity. We were able to look at maternal sensitivity and outcome measures and caregiver sensitivity. And we were able to break this into a number of groups to look at the patterns of people's sensitivity over time. Some that was going to be continuously great from six to 54 months, and some that was going to be continuously not so great from six to 54 months. What did we find? The more responsive, sensitive parents and sensitive caregivers were the ones who had kids who had the best outcomes at the start of kindergarten. So now we're thinking, what the heck's going on here? What is the key variable that's making this happen? And we had a hunch. We had a hunch that maybe it was that contingency that I showed you in the Laura and Ellie tape. Maybe there's something going on there about just knowing how to respond in time, in meaningfulness, in affect. Maybe all that was going to make a difference. Well, we had done this study. This is a word learning study in 24 to 30 month olds. This is Sarah Roseberry here, who's now at the University of Washington in Seattle. And we decided to do three different kinds of training. If we were right that it was the contingency, then you get that when you have a live interaction and you're teaching two words. And in fact, we knew from another study that we could teach these two words and the kids could learn it in a live interaction. And it would be broken if you did video training, right? Because in a video, it's not really contingent, even if you're given the same information. What about video chat? Well, video chat's kind of interesting. Video chat's this 2D display. So in that sense, it's kind of like watching television, right? But if we were right, it preserves contingency. And we wanted to see what was going to happen. And here is what happened. It turned out the video chat condition looked exactly like the live condition. The kids were able to learn both words in the live interaction, the video chat. And what you see here 
is 50%. A yoked video didn't work at all. The kids learned nothing. Wow. When contingency is preserved, kids do better in language. Well, wait a minute. There's a great natural experiment that's been going on. Like, you're breaking contingency every minute, guys, when you pick up your cell phones. <laughs> so we decided to take that into the lab and to test it out with the same two words that we've been using before. Notice what we were going to do in word one. We we're going to teach word one, interrupt it with a phone call, then teach word one again. So they got exactly the same amount of time on word one. And then teach word two uninterrupted. Of course, we're scientists. We're in the lab, so we have to counterbalance it. So we counterbalance it. And here, word one is un uninterrupted. Here is teaching word two, interrupted, and then word two. What happened? What happens with the interrupted and uninterrupted words? By you, an adult caregiver, using your cell phone. Well, I think I just have to show it to you because it's too dramatic to not show you. And here is what it looks like. Look, I want to show you something. Look, look what I'm doing to this baby. I'm blicking this baby. What am I doing? Blicking. What am I doing with this baby? Blicking baby. You were, oh. hello? It's going great. This, this one new baggies. I had a little bit of coffee, but you could always use more. <laughs> Oh, for sure. I'll bang sure. your head. <laughs> okay, she tried, right? But mom didn't engage with her. So, nah, it's the modern day still face study. All right, what were the results? This is Jessa Reed's, part of Jessa Reed's um, dissertation. And you can see that in the uninterrupted condition, the kids learned the words. And in the interrupted condition, it was no different than chance. Whoa! This contingency stuff is powerful. And more contingency stuff has come out in the last year that's equally powerful. What we're finding is that it turns out to be important when you're in a classroom. If teachers do things and have discussions with kids and it's contingent, by God, the kids learn something. And when they don't, boom, it's not. In fact, it's so powerful that Rachel Romeo has just done some beautiful work and she's finding out that the quality of the interaction contingency here seems to make a difference for brain structure. Oh, I lied to you before. I have a second picture of a brain. Sorry about that. Okay. It even affects the structure of the brain. That's unbelievable in four to six year olds. Four, children learn best in meaningful context. Well, when we've tried Learning spatial language, which is so important, above, under, around, through, in, out. This predicts out to math learning. And kids learn it better when they're doing something meaningful, like playing with blocks. Children need to hear diverse examples of words and language structures. It turns out that when you use more examples of the words in more contexts, you use sofa for couch and couch for sofa, Kids start to learn a richer language vocabulary and can start to substitute out. And there's data to suggest this is really important. And finally, vocabulary and grammatical development. Let me start by saying that we long ago realized that vocabulary was going to be a wonderful predictor of academic outcomes. But the reason that vocabulary was such a wonderful predictor is because kids who had strong language skills tended to have strong vocabulary skills. But today we've divorced the two. And if you go into many preschool classrooms, what you see is drill and kill of vocabulary items without adding the grammar or the language behind it. What's happening? They're not learning the words at all. And this is very exciting research, I think. So what do we do with it? Six principles. What can we possibly do with those six principles? Well, a couple of years ago, I was reading this piece from the Foundation for Child Development. It was called Three Mothers and an Eggplant. And I really loved this particular piece because, I don't know, somehow it really spoke to me. Mom is in a supermarket. 
and she's with her kid, and her kid sees an eggplant. We can imagine several scenarios, right? In one, baby, this might have been Hart and Risley's welfare mom, right? Walking through the supermarket, goes, what's that? And the mom goes, nothing, you won't like it, <laughs> and moves on. Baby two. Baby two is doing a little bit better. See what happens there. Mom says, or I'm sorry, baby says, what's that? Mom goes, it's an eggplant. We don't need eggplants, <laughs> and moves on. Then there's you guys. Oh my God. You hear baby say, what's that? You go, oh, it's an eggplant. Isn't it cool? It's kind of vegetable. Yes, and isn't it amazing that it has purple skin? You know, we should try an eggplant recipe. Let's weigh the eggplant. I mean, you go insane, okay? <laughs> now, <laughs> we would call the last one conversational, but here you can see the distinction between mother one and mother three, hitting all the principles, <coughs> hitting the six pieces. Wow, then the challenge. The challenge was whether we can turn mother one into mother three, whether we can use these same principles even for kids who are growing up with atypical language development because the research suggests it shouldn't be any different in how you learn language. And I'd like to suggest that yes, we can, that language strategies are learnable and they are malleable. So what I'd like to show you now are three examples of some work that we've been doing at the family level, the classroom level, and then at the community level, and then we'll open it up for questions. The Duet Project. The Duet Project was an exciting project that I started a couple of years ago in Philadelphia. Philadelphia, you should know, is the largest, poorest inner city in the nation. And this is my team. And we decided to do a community-based participatory research where we were working with a group called the Maternity Care Coalition to design with them, with community partners, a kind of intervention that we thought might work for the families in their community. The duet had several missions and goals. Our mission was to strengthen the developing communication foundation um, to enhance and predict language learning and school readiness outcomes. And we were gonna do it with four goals, to foster awareness and knowledge. Remember I told you most parents wouldn't know about Ellie and Laura and what they knew at 10 months, at 10 weeks? How can we help parents know that at 10 weeks of age, you can have a conversation with their child? Two, to empower caregivers. Three, to increase the quality and quantity of the interactions, and thereby to improve outcomes. We created a series of tapes and in fact, if you want to see them in action, you can go to this website and I will share my slides with you. They were all hand-drawn animations where we had this little brother in the corner who was going to comment on what mom was doing with the baby. And that helped mom see, wow, look, you did such a great job talking about the different kinds of cereal, mom. So it's not teachy-preachy by one mom to another mom. These tapes were designed to foster awareness, to help people understand the conversational duet, et cetera. And again, we're happy to share these tapes with any of you who would like to do further research on it. Right now, we're feeling quite convinced that even on light touch, we might get something from this. Here's what we got in study one. I want to add that these families were very low income. A lot of us work with low income families. This is, think of the lowest 20% of the low income sample. And in study one, 24 of 41 were earning less than 25K annually with low numbers, 15 in our control condition, nine in the intervention. We started out, by the way, with 60. That just lets you know how many people you lose here that you can't even contact again. So we can talk, if you like, later about what it's like to do community-based participatory research. You'll want to kill yourself first. But, <laughs> but I think it's really worthwhile because we're reaching populations we've never reached before. So when my students came back and they told me we had lost most of the Lenas in the experiment, that we couldn't find most of the parents anymore, I said, OK, how many people are left? 
They said, well, 24 people are left. We have 15 in the control and nine in the experimental. I said, it was a nice pilot study. You're not going to find anything. I was wrong. We got significant differences in the way parents interacted with their children, with the child outcomes, and with communication outcomes on a standardized test. That's kind of shocking, isn't it? At least it was shocking to me. We also went to 12 Head Start teachers from six classrooms. Um, the experimental teachers maintained high language use in the classrooms, and the control teachers did not. Over time, without having these tapes to keep them on par, it turns out that they dropped off in their level of interaction with their kids in this early Head Start program. We also worked with Ross on the California preschool curriculum framework. We used the six principles there. We also are looking in classrooms where we're actually presenting data. Here we have a group reading. And we do a group reading of something like the knights and the dragon and, dragon, and we're highlighting new words like galloping and shield. And then after we have the group reading, shared reading experience, which we know to be important for early language learning, we divide the kids into three groups, free play group, directed play, or guided play with props. And the kids get to act out some of what they saw in our story reading condition. What happened? Well, it turns out that in both of the directed play and the guided play conditions, the kids actually learned something. But when we just dumped the toys on them and told them to do anything that they liked, it wasn't focused enough for the kids. So if we're going to do these interactions and interventions with high quality interactions, we have to focus, help focus the kids' attention in the right way. We recently completed, and I mean really recently, it's being written up next month, a study where we realized that the teachers weren't really thrilled with our play conditions. So we gave them a lot of options. We gave them small group games and large group games and music and a digital condition. And we wanted to see if the kids learned better in a play only, in a reading only, or in a reading plus play. And I must admit, my hypothesis was that reading plus play was going to be the best. And what turned out to happen here is that in the classrooms that we looked at both in, with David Dickinson in Vanderbilt and with our team at Temple, the play was just as good as the shared reading. And anyone want to guess what was the best play condition? Anyone want to give it to large group games? Small group games? Do I have a vote? How about music? Actually, it was music. Music turned out to be the best, and the digital turned out to be the worst. Isn't that interesting? The digital where you didn't have the high quality interaction. And these are some of the results. We did rece uh, receptive and expressive language. And uh, they learned an average of five words out of the 20, retaining them over a delay of two months. So we were pretty excited about that. All right, next is I want to share with you some of what we're doing in community settings. This is where I go completely off the deep end, but bear with me here. I call it playful learning landscapes. Um, I went into a supermarket. This whole project cost us 60 bucks. It was done as an honors project. And luckily for us, the uh, kid who I was working with was going out with somebody who did graphic design. So you walked into the supermarket. These are the more sophisticated signs that we had later in Tulsa. And you saw this big monster-sized broccoli. And it said, healthy language helps your child's brain grow. Wow, cool. OK, that's your like on the cool factor. And then we put up signs throughout the supermarket. And I'll admit to you that our first signs didn't work at all. Because I wanted to do eggplants, right? <laughs> I was like into the eggplant story. But none of these families in the low-income neighborhoods we were in went down the produce aisle. So we had to go to dairy products and frozen veggies, which we ended up doing. The amazing thing is we just put prompts up. One of them might say something like, I'm a cow. I have milk. What else has milk? And the kids started talking with their parents. And the parents started responding. And in these low-income environments, 
we got a 33% increase in high quality conversation when the signs were up than when, when the signs were down. And you might be saying, how would you know? And the answer is, we dressed up in little white coats like we were going to be putting the apples back in the produce section. And we stood around with our little checklist. <laughs> and that's how we know. OK. Emboldened by the supermarket study, I decided, well, my gosh, we should be able to architecturally change the world in ways that would invite high quality conversations. And so I went to the local bus stop. And we decided that if we really want a good conversation, this is with Itai Palti, our architect from Israel, and Brenna Hassinger Das, that all we needed to do really was to put in things that got parents and kids engaged with one another. And so we did. One was a story kind of grammar where they had to go up and down little hills to build the story, and parents and kids did it. One was what I call executive function hopscotch, which I stole the happy sad task, and I built a hopscotch. And the kids, because it wasn't a regular pattern, they had to look first before they acted. And there's a little sign that says, can you put one foot where there's two and two feet where there's one? And the kids started to do it. And we put puzzles up everywhere. We worked with the community here. It was another community-based participatory research. They helped us decide how to put the scientific principles into action. They chose that they wanted Martin Luther King on the puzzles because this small lot was a small lot where Martin Luther King had given a speech at the Freedom March in Philadelphia. So they got a say. They have ownership. It's now been up, I should add, for a little over a year. We, we put it up last October. There's not one ounce of graffiti on this in the worst area of Philadelphia. You might be asking, what are the results? The results are that we're getting 30 to 50% increases in the interactions, the length of the interactions, in what they're talking about when they're doing the puzzle. They're using spatial language that I told you was so important. They're using number language that I told you was so important. It's mind boggling. Think about your interventions. Where are you getting 30 to 50% increases? Unbelievable, because the environment invited the parents to have conversations with their kids. This is uh, Andres Bustamante, who just took a faculty position at UC Irvine. And with him, we invented Parkopolis. Parkopolis is the human-sized board game. And the human-sized board game, notice it even, well, you can't see it from there. It starts at 0 and goes to 1. So you have to deal with things like fractions. And we changed the die. So here you have fraction dice, and here you have the normal 1 to 6. Now, I should tell you that I interviewed all the people at SRCD who do math learning to find out how we should represent fractions on a dice and what kind of games we should have on Parkopolis. We had science games. We had math games. The kids went in, and the control group was a group of people playing with a rocket building activity. All right? It was a really good control. And nonetheless, you got 79% more interactions, language, lang language and interaction about math, about space, and about science in Parkopolis than you got in the rocket exhibit. All of these projects are designed to use our science to garner more conversations in the places where people live. We've been converting libraries in Philadelphia. We're doing sidewalks in Seattle so we can have safe sidewalks to school. People have asked us con to consider prisons and homelessness, homelessness shelters. And we're going to consider all of them and try to put the infrastructure into place. For my part, rather than just spewing it out into the world, my hope is that what we can do is be the scientists who test it to make sure it works, come up with a common website where we're going to put the designs for any cities that want to use them, have groups that form in the cities, and then let the city budgets 
take it from here. So you only need philanthropic dollars once. Finally, I want to say it's very important to measure, to measure the outcomes and to know that we're actually getting language to happen in these conditions. So we invented a new test. It's called QUILS, the Quick Interactive Language Screener. It's all done on a little laptop, and it's a touch screen. So the kids do everything that's self-contained. It's a receptive language task. It only takes 15 minutes to do. And what we did is we got a group of scientists together, Jill de Villiers, who's a major language researcher, me, Roberta, and Achilles Iglesias, who's working on the um, Spanish version. We have a bilingual test that will also be on the market. And we decided we hated the PPVT so much that we wanted to expand what we were looking at in language. One was to look at product and process, how kids learn and what they learn. I mean, it could be that a lot of kids just don't do so well in language because they're not getting enough of it. Remember that principle? And they're not getting the high quality interactions. That doesn't mean they can't learn. It just means that they didn't learn because they didn't get the exposure, product and process, right? And our hypothesis was everyone would look the same in process. They might not look the same in product. We also look here. We decided to do nouns, verbs, prepositions as vocabulary, and also look at grammar. And our first find, well, this is actually what the test looks like. Show me the hinge. The FEP is blue. Show me the blue FEP. Can you show me another FEP? All right, so they have to generalize. Remember I told you in many cases we had the case where they learn a vocab and they can't generalize? So this is all taken from our literature. And here are the results. One, it works. It shows beautiful Raj progressions on language growth. This is from 673 different participants in the monolingual test. There are significant SES differences in both, unfortunately, process and in product. I was really sad to see that. It turned out that Anne Fernald is right and that process does depend on what kind of input you have. So, the five-year-old low-income kids that we had in process looked very much like the three-year-old middle-income kids, which made me very sad. <laughs> Vocabulary, syntax, and process are linked across the course of development. That was principle six. And over here in the bilingual test, and I thought this was interesting, products are linked within but not across languages, but processes are linked across both languages. So how you learn is pretty consistent. And as you grow in how you learn, your processes grow in all language. But for the products, it depends what you're hearing. So there it is, guys, the bottom line. The bottom line is that if we want to build a strong foundation in language that's going to predict out to the kinds of outcomes that the world tells us they're very interested in at the doorstep of formal schooling, we need to have strong language. And I think our field has reached a consensus as to what strong language can look like. Six principles, thousands and thousands of papers. Children learn what they hear most. They learn the words for the things that interest them. Interactive, high quality environments matter. They learn best in meaningful contexts. They need to hear diverse examples and vocabulary and grammar go together. I believe we can reduce what they call the 30 million word gap that Hart and Risley shared with us. I think we can help all kids be ready to read by age five, and we can measure our progress. And again, I'd like to suggest, I mean, Sally's got 90% of kids with autism are doing amazingly, not amazingly well, but they're doing, they're getting the normal curve. They're talking, okay? And we used to think, I remember when I was in grad school, I learned 75% of autistic kids won't talk, and you have 90% talking. We can do this. We can do this if we only look at what the science is teaching us and keep the integrity. And I'd like to suggest a lot of it comes down to having rich conversations. And that is how high quality language primes high quality reading and high quality learning. I do have to give acknowledgement to Roberta Golenkoff, 
who I do everything with. She has been my partner in crime for the last uh, 38 years and uh, the best lab ever that pulls all this off. Of course, the kids who are in my lab and the people who support us. And you can't have a talk without showing off the grandkids. So here they are. These are the people who are giving me my current inspiration. And Roberta and I try really hard to tweet out the new findings in our field as they come along. So if you follow us, uh, we'll share whatever we learn with you. How does your intervention address the sensitivity and attunement and contingency in the early relationships for language? Well, I think what we have to do a, a much better job of at this point is really nailing some of that social contingency. In fact, the next project that I hope to do, we have to see if it's actually possible because it's just starting. And you have to understand, this is like, this is news for those of us in the language world. Um, but there are some folks who have figured out how to measure um, synchrony in parenting and kid at the same time. Like Ruth Feldman's done a lot of that work in your world. Um, in our world, it's kind of not been done. And um, especially with respect to language, there are very few people. Casey Lou Williams at Princeton is just starting. So um, we actually want to try it with EEG. And we know that you can do this in a classroom because it's been done. So we just ordered the little caps. And um, we have the guy who did the classroom work is going to be working with me and Kathy Temis Lamanda and team uh, to actually nail it and to see if we get brain synchrony and to have the temporal synchrony. Uh, yeah, kind of. Yeah. So I, so I don't want to speak too soon to tell you whether we can do it or not, because apparently kids have to be relatively still in order to get these measures to work. And um, so we currently have the caps. We have these little, I, I understand they're called like little gummy bear things that will allow the caps to stay on the head. And we're literally today looking in the lab to see if these gummy bear things. So if it works, wouldn't that be amazing? And wouldn't it be incredible if you learned more language when you had the sweet spot of the parent and kid on the same page? It'd be unbelievable. So we're going to try to get more refined. We're just not there yet. I see all this in terms of positive reinforcement. And I'm wondering if you've thought about um, studying the nature of the interactions between the teachers and the students to determine if there are more positive kinds of reinforcements that children are responding to, like smiles versus not smiles, or speed of response versus slower response, or, you know, like the, the emotional quality. I know it's hard to get at, it's really hard to get it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a really interesting idea, and I absolutely think you're onto something. You know, I think, f first of all, we know that this contingency thing has a lot to it, right? On the one hand, people like Mark Bornstein tell us that if you don't respond within like two seconds, the gig's up, OK? And then there are people like Michael Goldstein who tell us, that if you respond with something different than what the person was talking about. Look, you've all been in conversations like that, right? Somebody responds too long, like, what's that about? Or what about the people who start talking and they're not talking about what you were talking about, right? Highly non-reinforcing, right? And, and the third is when people don't give you, like, you call real excited or you talk to somebody real excited and then they go, right? So obviously there has to be something that fuels the continuation of this. Do I think that behavioral tendencies can account for all of it? I really don't. I must say that in that way, um, I, I think you know, in 1959, Noam Chomsky was kind of right about language. You just can't explain language growth through behaviorism. It, it just doesn't, it doesn't work because it can't explain the recursiveness. You know, it's a, if you have a way, you'll be the only one who, who does. So I would love to, I really would love to hear it. So uh, in working with a child who has ADHD and dyslexia, um, sometimes the two things kind of cross and it's hard to know which one you're actually dealing with. Do you have any suggestions in terms of how to build a child's vocabulary when reading is so difficult for them, but you're trying to bridge that gap? Yeah, I mean, there are experts in this room, so I probably should say virtually nothing here. But I will nonetheless say something, which is um, 
one way to go is to not start with reading, right? It is to start by building the vocabulary itself. And with kids who are all over the place, and we've all had kids who are all over the place, finding something that interests them is actually a really good way to at least unlock the door and get in. But um, again, there are people who deal with ADHD who are here, and I should let them speak to it. But that would be my, my initial advice. So I have two questions. One is very quick, but the first one is, obviously this is geared, your intervention is geared toward younger kids, around preschool five. But do you have any idea about sensitivity in terms of what age span? So you mentioned prisoner. So what is the upper age? You have you tracked that at all in terms of if there's a difference? There's a certain critical stage. At yeah, you know, I I don't know the answer to that. I suspect because we have the classroom data, right? And that classroom data was predicting things <coughs> like years later, that this kind of contingency and discussion in classrooms is going to turn out to be really, really important. But in the language world, I must say, we don't do much with older kids. I think it's a fallacy of our field. Um, do you have some stuff that you want to, because I, I mean, there's just not a lot. A lot of us, this is even embarrassing to say, but it is true, which is a lot of us kind of feel like the gig is up by the time they're four and a half. You know, like, wow, they've done it. They're amazing. Look at them. And that doesn't mean that it is. There's so much more to learn. And I suspect that this is, and I'll tell you why I think it's even more important or so important, not just the classroom data. But I find myself responding in ways that are bothered by or not bothered by like artificial intelligence things. So for example, the pat answers by Siri or on the phone when I call American Airlines or try to make a train reservation. It doesn't work. And I find that after like four tries with this thing on the other side, I just keep yelling, human, human, give me a human. And I'm sure that that frustration is because the language interaction thing isn't working so well. And the same thing is true with my GPS. I have no idea why after I give my GPS a command, it doesn't just do it, but it doesn't. It repeats it and says, you want to call blah, 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 blah. Yes, that's what I told you. So because it violates so many of the Gricean principles and, and it is all pat, I think it teaches us how important it is for all of us in the way we learn and the way we interact and you know, just one more quick example is that I find when my kids are on the other side of the dinner table, they're all grown now, they're all adults, right? And they look down to look at a text, I honest to God notice. And it feels intensely rude to me when they don't respond in time. So I think we're onto something here. And I think we need to flesh it out. And another whole body of research will be fleshing it out with some of these gadgets and gizmos, I think, to ask what are we doing there in depriving people of enough of that human-to-human -human contact? That's mentioned. We don't know what they're listening to in their headphones. But the quick question was for speed of processing. Can we yeah. just use that from the WISC? Is, is that what Fernald used? Or? Um, no, she didn't. She studied it the way I just showed you. Yeah. And, and the speed of processing, it was a very nice measure where she was looking at the time, again, with little kids. But it's got to be true, because I will tell you, I definitely feel it when I'm in Paris or something, and I can't catch those words fast enough. I'm just not efficient, and it definitely ruins my comprehension. Ross, did you want to? What about the affect of scientists? So I, I find myself looking at what you're doing and, and the examples you're describing. I wonder how much affect is the unmeasured variable. Um, in the power of contingency, in some of the socioeconomic differences you're seeing, in what um, is really going on, or what is part of what's going on when um, parents are motivated to use language and use language in a affectively positive. I mean, the, the hard, in the hard and Risley findings, it turns out the affect, the affective tone of the communications were as strong a predictor of long-term vocabulary as were the numbers of words. And that's been so unmeasured in this research. And I'm wondering if you're going to change that. 
<laughs> that's, such a, that's such a great question. I would say we can jointly try to change that. But, um, but there's really virtually nothing on that in, in my literature. You know, and I do think it has to change, which is why I said I think contingency involves <coughs> affect as well. And I think it has to involve affect. I'm not sure we know how to get at that or how to measure it. One of the things I think is going to turn out to be really important about the play research that I do, but that's for another talk, is, um, is that I really do think the joy of play uh, is actually fueling the increase in conversations. And I'm trying to look at some of that now, but it's going to be at a pretty crude level. And it, you know, it's going to take a team that is much better able to do this kind of research than my team would be, because we're just not schooled in it at all. You know, it's just not something we know. The six points, for instance, were reminding me of just high quality instruction and teaching. <laughs> and um, I know that's not something that necessarily every student receives and every teacher even has. Um, and it's something that is acquired over time. And um, but, you know, what would be your suggestions for making a reform or policy so that, you know, more students would receive that type of high quality instruction uh, in language instruction? Well, thank you for asking that question. I'll give you two answers. Um, one is that I think we have to languageize classrooms. Um, it's a funny word, but we came up with it after thinking of Simonizing your car. And, um, and I, I think that we can, through something, I don't mean to say these are simple, but they're at least what I call edible science, accessible, digestible, and usable. And I think if we can just get to a point where our science is at all accessible, digestible, and usable, that we're going to have a chance to help teachers realize that it's more about the dialogue. Um, for too long, I believe we've been stuck in what I'll call the dispenser model of education, where essentially it's, I know everything, you know nothing, I'm going to dump it on you. And that makes an assumption about the child that I think has been totally dismissed in the scientific literature, that the child is a passive recipient of information rather than a discoverer and explorer who himself generates and transforms knowledge. So the first thing we need to do is to start the dialogue. Um, the second answer to your question is in our book, Becoming Brilliant, I actually did the same thing I did for language, but did it with a broader suite of skills that I think are going to be um, consensus building for education itself. And in that, because now you know how important I think um, early interactions and the quality of those interactions are, in it we talk about six, um, the six C's. And the first is collaboration, building community, building that kind of back and forth of the dialogue. That is the foundation, I think, on which all rests. The next is communication. Right, which is listening as much as it is talking. The next is content. Content is there, but it also has learning to learn skills. Um, then we add critical thinking to that, sifting through it, creative innovation, and confidence to take intellectual risks, to learn from failure, to have growth mindset in the Dweckian kind of way, and also to have grit. Um, you know, which is part of a bigger picture. Now, a lot of people have suggested pieces of this before, but you can't just pull grit out and say that's the magic bullet. And you can't just pull content out and say that's all we need to do. So I think by thinking of it in a more systemic way, so then what are we doing with it? Um, I, I'm really proud to say we have two school districts that we're working with. One of them is in Grand Rapids, Michigan that is about to become a 6C school. And we're training them on playful learning methods, which is going to help with the dialogue, and where we're going to um, help kids learn by having a thematic-based, interest-based, which would help uh, you know, your son um, go through their education. And when you ask, will that make a difference for things like vocab, I'll just give you one example from one other school. I'm sorry for the long-winded answer. Um, oh, by the way, the Grand Rapids School, why I'm so excited about it is because it's 80% free lunch, okay? It's 50% um, immigrant, 
where the kids actually worry each day whether their parents are still going to be there when they go home, okay? And where the school district can only go up. And we honestly believe this is going to be a way. Now, turns out that even in a high-performing school near Philadelphia, where they're trying the same thing, they called me in last year because they were shocked because their numbers on their standardized outcome that they have to report to the state zoomed by trying this kind of thematic play-based approach. And I'll just give you one example of one classroom that I went into where they were doing weather, OK? And the teachers, you know, I would say two-thirds of the teachers doubted whether this was going to work, OK? I walk into the classroom, and here are these kids. First of all, the classroom is just this buzz of excited, wonderful energy, but not disruptive energy. There's a group at a table. And what they're doing is trying to figure out how many raindrops it would take to fill the diameter of a circle that's on their page, and then to graph it. Kindergarten. Kindergarten, OK? And they're asking scientific questions and making predictions about it. The next table, I see these kids. And they got like this cardboard shoebox that they've made into a makeshift camera. So I said to the kid, what are you doing? She says, oh, I'm the TV producer. And I am taking the film of the map over there that the other kid will show you. So the kid starts filming. The other kid comes in. She says, oh, yes, there's a front coming across the United States. And with it, there will be a low pressure area. And when the low pressure, really? In kindergarten? So the teachers, to a T, when I went back, said, look at how much these kids are learning by thinking of a broader suite of skills. And it's precisely these kinds of things where we use the consensus of science to help really bootstrap what education could be. And I sure hope that if we can get proof positive on a couple of school districts, that other schools will follow. Yeah, my name is Arthur, and uh, I'm an endowed with autism. Uh, I didn't uh, learn to talk until six. And I also learned to read when I was about seven. So it's kind of interesting. But uh, in any case, I think I also have been teaching some special ed classes in, uh, special ed classes in uh, two school districts in, in Mount Sacramento. And I noticed that uh, a lot of the these kids in these low-income areas that don't have books in the house at all. So what do you, what do you suggest? Uh, maybe the school district should give books to the parents so the parents read to the kids because nobody ever reads to these some of these low-income kids. What do you, uh, I know this is roughly what you were talking about. Yeah, yeah. And that's when, we, when I said to you about routines. That's exactly what, what we found, too. I mean, there were some families that did and some didn't. I mean, the projections that I heard from Russ Whitehurst were that you're, you're dead on. 25% of low-income homes have 10 or fewer age-appropriate books. So you know, you got to change that. And Reach Out and Read is trying to do that. They're, they currently have a reach of 4.5 million families. And what they're doing is they're having the pediatricians hand out books at well visits and getting them into the home. So thank you for that. You're exactly, exactly right. In one of your earlier slides, you mentioned that um, language at school entry is one of the best predictors of outcome. I got that it was a predictor of outcome for reading, vocab. Does it also for working memory, attention, is there? We hadn't measured that. Our, our five indicators where we had, um, and, the, and many of these were off of the WJR. OK, so we had math outcomes, conceptual math and calculated math. We had um, reading. Um, and depending on the grade, that actually changed a little bit, too, because it turns from letter sound correspondence, you know, word attack skills to something that's more like the closed procedure. Uh, we had uh, social skills, and that wasn't the WJR. That was a set. I can't remember what it was, but we did have a, a measure of social skills, um, but, 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 but executive function, and then language. And we looked at each one of those as a predictor of the others. Okay, and then we asked which of the many indicators predicted out to the most outcomes, and the answer was language. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with the promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. 
Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.